Okay, so so we'll probably have a quick uh, demonstration on web services with Access Two. And before I start, so all this this the the whole history of web services, what is a web service, all these concepts are relevant uh, mostly to what we call standard web services. And there is an alternative way that what we call restful web services, which we are going to talk about in the next class. Now, m in, in the consumer space, meaning that if you go to, say, Google or Yahoo or uh, uh, even Amazon, so some Amazon services for that matter, if you go, f go to them, when they say service, if when Google says we will be exposed as a service, or when Yahoo says it's exposed as a service, they don't mean exposed as a SOAP-based web service. They usually mean it's exposed as a restful web service, which we'll cover next time. But uh, they, the concepts involved, some basic concepts are the same, but uh, protocols involved, uh, you know, this whole thing about WSDL and all that, they're all different when it comes to restful web services. So it's a completely different beast, as you put it. Okay, so this is, we are going to actually look at, uh, uh, mostly in brief detail, what, what, is, what is a web service and how they came about and what are the basic components of a standard web service and how, how do these things fit together and all that, right? Um, here, here you go. So this is a standard definition. So if you search for the official definition of web service, you will probably hit this one from W3C. Now it, it's it's a lengthy piece of uh, boilerplate, you know, text, right? But uh, what is uh, important to notice in this definition is that it has this word called machine-to-machine -machine interaction, right? And then there's something called WSDL, SOAP, HTTP, XML, all these catchphrases that we learned. Some of them that we learned already there. Uh, so if, if you read this, it says a web service is a software system designed to support interoperable machine-to-machine -machine interaction, which is the most important phrase here, over a network. It has an interface described in a machine processable format, and there's a format called WSDL, so it says specifically WSDL. Other systems interact with the web service in a manner prescribed by its description using SOAP messages typically conveyed using HTTP with an XML serialization in conjunction with other web-related standards. So all this text, what matters to you most is this piece, machine-to-machine -machine interaction. Right? So this is how the early web looked like. There, it was assumed and really there was a human at one end looking at whatever the information that is on the web through a web browser. So everything that you do is basically targeted towards that human. Right? So you make a web page, you make it look nice. You you put pictures there, and you when you have say something like a name or an address, you format it in a way that easier for the human to understand. But it has nothing regarding the whether the browser would understand it or the browser's job is just to show it to the human. Right? The human would make sense of it. Right? And this sort of change, there, there was a time that when, when, it, uh, when the web or the, the internet really was pretty much uh, stabilized, they, they wanted to do a, okay, this is basically the same thing. They wanted to do a machine to machine uh, interaction, meaning a machine <coughs> is now on the other side, not a human. So what changes when you put a machine on the other side than a human? So machines are, they can do things faster, but they're dumb. Dumb meaning you have to tell them everything, all details in, in, uh, in, in, very, in, a, in a very precise manner. So you, basically you have to write programs to make machines do things, right? So when, when, you, ha when you have something like a, a machine to machine interaction over the web or over the internet really uh, there are several challenges the first challenge is uh, how do you how do you make them understand all this and so so there were many people who thought of these things and then there were many frameworks that came about so if you heard of this thing called decom uh, 
right? If you are from the Microsoft world, you probably heard of that. So it's a distributed uh, component object model, something like that, right? So DCOM is Microsoft's way of using the internet to have a distributed system, meaning uh, implement things, uh, implement machine-to-machine -machine interactions, right? And then there was another, so uh, the problem with DCOM is that DCOM is uh, somewhat Microsoft specific and only Microsoft and one company on the Linux world, uh, Noel, supported it. And nobody has thought anything. And then there was Koba. Koba is uh, common object request broker architecture. It's again a, a, a very elaborate framework of doing machine to machine interactions over the web. But everybody, including Sun, IBM, and the whole Java world, go, went with Koba, not Microsoft. So that didn't fly at again. It didn't fly at all. And then uh, there, was some, there was something called RMI, which is remote method invocation specific to Java. So there are many, many, uh, many frameworks. But all of these frameworks, one, one, one thing that is very uh, uh, visible in these early frameworks is that they thought of machine-to-machine -machine communication and human machine-to-human communication, like you know the web and and uh, these interactions with machines, as completely separate things. They basically thought that there's nothing; they have nothing to to do with each other. So you build the complete network layer, you know, you have different ports to communicate, you have different applications, you have no sharing of any protocols between these two. And then when web became very, very popular and everybody had access to web, then there was this argument like, why do you have to sort of reinvent everything? <clears throat> why don't you use all these HTTP and all, all these nice protocols that were built for, for humans, but still capable of carrying, you know, text data, right? Why don't we use them, those protocols, and build a machine-to-machine -machine interaction uh, system on top of the current protocol stacks that were meant actually for humans. So that's where really web services come into play. So all these DCOM and COBA and uh, RMI, we don't call them really web services. When we call web services, we actually mean that things that work on the existing web infrastructure. That's what we mean. And that includes protocols like HTTP as well. Um, so doing machine-to-machine -machine communication using web protocols, like meaning HTTP and uh, uh, not HTML, basically HTTP, right? Um, there are several challenges. The biggest challenge is the primary protocol that HTTP carries is HTML, but HTML is presentation oriented, right? It's meant for a human and not for a, a machine. So you need some language, right? A markup language that is content oriented. And then the other biggest thing is there, there are these uh, understandings. So humans are intelligent. So you have a big link that says press here to go to the next page or click here to continue. Of course a human can read it and he'll click it. But how do you tell a machine specifically that in order to go to the next step you have to follow this link? You have to very specifically define that, right? You have to de specifically define that, okay, this is this, this this is what it is, and when you follow this, you have to give these particular inputs, and you will be returned these particular outputs. Right? If there is a fault, this is what you will get. So you have to define all these things very precisely. So you need some description language that machines can process. Right? That's the second challenge. For human, humans are intelligent. They can read it and understand. But for machines, they don't understand anything unless we say so. Right? And the third one is how do we find the service? If somebody wants to put up a service, right? For for web pages, we use a search engine. We Google for it and we'll hit it. we'll get it. Can we do the same for services? Can, uh, how can how can you find a service and how can you 
say I want a service that takes this particular thing or this this particular data structure as an input and right? things like that. So these challenges were uh, solved using several related la languages and uh, uh, systems. So one is XML actually came about to to overcome the challenge of content oriented uh, language, markup language. So XML was primarily meant to cater for this machine to machine communication. And SOAP, you will see when we go to that, SOAP is a specific XML format. So it's a markup language, of course, we, we, SOAP used to stand for Simple Object Access Protocol. Uh, so pe people realized halfway through that it's not simple, it's not about objects, and it's not a protocol. So they just kept the name but dropped the drop the description of it. So it's still called SOAP, but it no longer stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. It's just SOAP. Um, so then there, there's another language called Web Services Definition Language, which is which we call WSDL or, or, or simply WSDL. And WSDL is a language that lets you describe services. It's again an XML file, but it has these precise pieces of information that says what type of messages should you pass, what what how do you access them, what are the URLs, right? Um, how should you package them? Should you send just plain XML or should you package it in a soup uh, like uh, packet or is there anything else that you should do? All these things are uh, explained or described very precisely in WSTF. And then there's something called UDDI, Universal Description, Discovery and Integration. UDDI is this search engine for services. And very sadly, UDDI was not done in an extensible manner and UDDI was there at first and IBM, Microsoft, and everybody put up uh, public UDDI repositories where you can, you know, things like Google for web services. But then uh, there was too many problems with the stand, with the protocols and too many problems with how it was actually built and they all abandoned it. So UDDI is sort of mm, no longer there. So we will probably you know skip it, but this is how they are related. So when you write a web service, right, you basically so th this is you. You provide the web service. Let's say you you want to expose some of your expose your your website as a service, so that somebody can write a little plugin to say Firefox and show content from your website, right? So uh, if, if you want to do that, so basically you implement whatever the business logic, in, this, in your case you will probably read from a file and dump it, right? So once you do that, you, you have to associate with your, with your service with the WSDL document. This one, if you use something like .NET or Access2 or some a very well established framework, it, this file will be generated for you. If not, you'll probably have to write it by hand or use another separate tool to generate it, which is not really elegant to do, basically. Meaning it's it's not very intuitive, and unless you know inside out of it, you, it's not going to be easy. Uh, so it's it's best for to use a tool that generates it automatically. And then the usual pattern is when somebody wants to use the service, they look take the WSDL. And when you take the WSDL, as I said, the WSDL contains all the documents, or all the pieces of information that you need to access this web service. There are tools that lets you generate code looking at the WSDL. So you don't have to, you know, form URLs or do anything. You just say, okay, this is the WSDL, and then there, like .NET, for example, right? .NET will generate a generate all the code that you need and then it will give you a class with some method saying if you access this method you it will call the web service get everything and give you back a string right so most of the work that you have to do is sort of uh, already been done at uh, when you actually have a WSD. and so here's the search engine piece now unlike uh, the, the web case where when you put up a web website you don't actually ask Google to index it. 
Google this, it's not automatically, right? In this case, the, the, the publishing has to be explicit. That is, you have to tell the registry, hey, I have a website here. Right? And there's a specific way of saying that. So as a web service provider, you were supposed to put it up on the repository if you want people to access it. And then uh, users can either ask, if, if they know that it's you who's doing the service, <coughs> they can ask for the WSDL directly from you, or search the repository and sort of get it, right? Uh, look for the whatever the service that matches their need and then get it. The problem with this approach is, one, they didn't want to do this. Most of these uh, web service providers thought that this is an unnecessary step. And whoever wanted the, the web, uh, web service access details, say the WSDL document, would either ask directly from these people, right? And, uh, or, or just search Google for the Vistal and just get it because they anyway published it uh, online, right? So this one reason for, for the demise of UDDI is this, the explicit need for registration. And then again, there were not many controls, meaning that, uh, say, the public registry that IBM and Microsoft had, had enormous amount of junk. Because everybody will put some junk there. Right? It, it, they may not put junk at the first first point, but after a while they'll just change their web service, right? And uh, they won't update the registry. So the registry became like a big garbage dump. So one reason why IBM put it down was it was becoming uh, uh, unmanageable and it was not useful at all. So the model of UDDI having a central repository publicly is sort of dead. But uh, internally, like I've heard that uh, Dell, for example, the whole supply chain for Dell is running on SOAP-based web services, and Dell has internally one UDDI registry that uh, that is private for them, but it has all the contact details, all the services that that are available for their network. Right? So there are some uses of UDDI still internally, but as a public uh, way, uh, public. Uh, repository or registry service, it's sort of dead. Now, our focus is going to be on this guy and this guy. Right? But this is the overall big picture. Um, XML, we, we all know this, so I'm, I'm probably going to quickly skip this piece. What is SOAP? So as I said, SOAP is another XML format. but it's special, meaning it has its own namespace, right? You know what a namespace is, I suppose, right? So it, SOAP has its own namespace, and there are three elements in the, in the SOAP structure. One is called the envelope. The second one is called the header. The third one is called the body. So the envelope in a SOAP message must be the outermost element. The root element in a, in, a, in a SOAP XML is the envelope element. And the envelope should contain optionally the head, meaning it's, the head is not mandatory, but the body is mandatory. And those two are the only elements that the, the, the envelope can carry. There's one called fold that, um, that the envelope can carry, but if there's the fold, I think you can ignore head and body or something like that. Uh, so the, the point is that it, it looks a lot like a regular mail that you send, right? So, uh, okay, whatever goes inside body and header is, soap doesn't care. So it, it's basically regular XML that goes inside header and body, but they say that, you know, they should be packaged in that way. It's just like a regular mail that you send. So as long as uh, there's the address and the stamp, and the, the proper size of envelope, mail service doesn't care what you put in it. Right? Of course, they'll say, you know, hazardous material not allowed, but except that, whether it's a letter or it's a brochure or it's, uh, say, some uh, something else, they, they wouldn't care. 
So you can package whatever you want to send inside that that XML, and that's what SOAP is really. And because SOAP is a XML format, you can't just send it because SOAP is basically text, right? You need some application level protocol for you to that that is capable of carrying text to take it. So the most common choice is HTTP. So 90% of all these SOAP messages that pass around goes on top of HTTP. Right? And then uh, SMTP, the mail transfer protocol, is also a common choice, but not as common as HTTP. But it, it, it is, so SOAP has what we call a binding for SMTP as well. Um, so because SOAP is text, it actually doesn't have to be transferred via means of a computer, really. You can write a SOAP message in your notepad, take a printout, right, put it in an envelope, and send it over by regular mail. And whoever gets, in, gets it on the other side can uh, scan it and process it if they want to. So it doesn't have to be uh, sort of like in, in, a, in, a, in a computer means. It can be, it's, it's text. So it can be any other way of transferring text, right? You don't care whether you attach it to a, you know, pigeon and send it. <coughs> Nobody cares. As long as it's correct and as long as it's text. Now, this one we are going to discuss in very much detail. But, I mean, not too much detail, but at least for you to understand what is contained there. So the WSDL, again, an XML-based description, but it's sort of, uh, have these things like message structure and uh, what is how what are the operations that are available what kind of inputs and outputs and false and what are the endpoints meaning what <coughs> URL do you call to get it all that detail um, so this we are gonna skip and uh, there are many other aspects in web services that we need to think of meaning uh, because web services were built on top of existing protocols, like say, say it was built on top of HTTP. To me, what that meant was that it was uh, supposed to be independent from whatever the underlying protocol. So, so you can either use your, you know, pigeon method or your SMTP or HTTP. In, if you use, using either way should not affect any uh, quality of service, meaning any uh, uh, anything like security that you implement on top of it. That was the idea. So all these protocols like security and reliability and routing and all those things were built on top of it, on, on SOAP. So there's a specification called WS Security. It tells you how to encrypt a mes web service message. Then there's a, a, a reliability specification called WS Rx reliable web services, reliable exchange that tells you how do you make sure the message went the other way, like how many times do you retransmit, how do you uh, process acknowledgments, things like that. And then there's something called WS address. How do you say that uh, when, you, when, when your message passes through multiple hops, how do you specify that this is just an intermediary and not a, the ultimate receiver, all these things. They had they built them from scratch on top of SOAP, and uh, that's one downside of it. Meaning that if you actually look at the web services world, it's uh, uh, very complicated, right? Ex except that this picture looks quite uh, simple, but there are many things that gets added onto this, which makes this whole web services world extremely difficult to navigate and uh, work with, really. Because each of these protocols, so WS addressing had two or three revisions of the protocol. So one guy would suppose uh, support version 1.1, the other one would support 1.2, and they can't work together. Right? So there, there are many issues. There were many issues like that earlier. Um, okay. How do you create and consume web services? So this is basically what's going to be important to you. And, and the part of the idea of doing this, doing this lecture, these lectures, 
basically web services, then REST, and then uh, a little bit on mashups, is giving you an idea of what is possible to do for your project. So you may not want to, you know, you are not going to have to do the assignment on this. And there's not going to be another exam also. Right? But uh, this is going to be useful, at least the understanding is going to be useful for your project. That's the idea. Now, how do you do all this? Do all this? How do you do web services? There's no need for you to write everything from scratch. Actually, you don't even have to know how WSDL works, or maybe a slight understanding of SOAP, but you don't have to know them inside out. Right? What you do is you use a, a framework. So there are many frameworks. There are free and open source options. So I can definitely tell you about Axis 2, which is a, a Java framework originally, but there's a C version also. And then there are there's another one from Apache called Xfire, and then Java 6 has standard web service tools that comes with the JDK. And then if, if you go to the Microsoft world, then there's this thing called Microsoft uh, Windows Communication Framework, or WCF. I think it came with Vista at first. It has built-in support for web services, basically. And if you, if you use Visual Studio or .NET, whatever that uh, .NET Studio, it's basically a few clicks for you to make something a web service, or a few clicks to uh, consume a web service. Actually, in, 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 in uh, Visual Studio, it's very, very easy. And uh, I have not mentioned Eclipse also has a you know web toolkit platform edition, which has all the tools that you need built in to do web services. So it's OK if you don't understand a lot of these. Right? It's it, basically all you have to do is all you have to really understand is that what is the relationship between all these pieces. So if you go to say WCF and you say I want to consume a web service, it will say point to the WSDL, and at that point you will be wondering like what the hell is this WSDL? So that's what uh, what we want to get to, right? Like what is the role of WSDL and where does it fit in and all that. Um, so so. Now, I'm going to actually quick, very quickly go through uh, most of these things. This, this SOAP processing model, we'll probably uh, skim through it, but not go in pretty much detail. Um, so do, uh, SOAP was developed as a W3C standard, so Microsoft and IBM were the biggest uh, contributors to it. And uh, as, as, I was said, as I said, it used to stand for simple object access protocol. And then they realized that it's neither simple, it's not about objects, and it's not even a protocol. So they just said, okay, we'll keep the name for historical reasons, but it's not going to stand for that same phrase anymore. Right? And in a nutshell, it's basically XML format, and uh, it's independent on whatever it travels on. So you can use either HTTP or SMTP or whatever the text-based protocol that you want to send or you want to use with SOAP. Um, yeah, so there, there are multiple uh, specifications, so we'll probably look at 1.2. Actually, there are minor, only minor differences, so it wouldn't really matter what version you look at. Um, the main, main difference is with this particular fold element. Yeah. Um, so so here's, here's how it, like a, the pictorial view, like the big blocks, right? There's a huge thing called envelope, and the header and the body will be the two things, and this swoop header is optional, really. And this is, let me actually see, okay. Uh, yeah, there are some some syntax rules which which you can actually look at, and it basically says you can you it has to be XML, it has to be valid XML, it has to have this SOAP envelope and SOAP encoding namespaces, right? It's a must, and it can't have these things called DTDs, which are old references to how the content should be formatted, and it can it cannot have anything called a processing instruction. You know what processing instructions are, right? Um, so this is how it looks like. So it, it doesn't mean that this processing instruction is invalid. 
this is valid. What it means is that you can't have processing instruction inside here. Right? In regular XML, that that can happen, but not in SOAP. So here's 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 the SOAP message. Of course, it's not easy to make head or tail out of it. But uh, what you want what you want to notice? Oh, sadly the colors are not here. So let me see whether I can show you this one. So this piece, the green piece, of course. This I I meant the green piece with P I E. C, right? Not peace. <laughs> uh, I said rest in peace. So, uh, so this part is the header, right? This part is the body, right? And there are pieces of arbitrary XML in between, you see. And and uh, this is what we call the SOAP namespace, right? And you see. What is important is that env call an envelope, env call the header, call an header, and env call an body, and everything else is somebody else's namespace. Like this m, it's not, it's not, we don't know what it is. It's p, somebody else's namespace. So the whole XML that went inside body was somebody else's, but only so provided the packaging, right? Um, yeah, so, so this is how it looks like. So the envelope, and, and this is the SOAP namespace, 1.2 uh, spec namespace. Um, SOAP header is optional, right? Okay, so wh what is the difference between the header and body? What goes in header, what goes in body? That's a, a good uh, uh, discussion to have. So you can think of the header as the outside piece of the envelope, so the, or the uh, outside surface of the envelope. What do you write on the envelope? Do you write your whatever the details that you want your, your, your whoever the other side you are your receiver to see? Do would you write it on the envelope? It's completely. Uh, uh, it's 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 not appropriate to do that, right? Sometimes you know if when you send a postcard, you don't mind what. Whatever you write, you say, okay, hi from Alaska, and you write, send a postcard. So you don't care whether the other seat or not, right? But there are some sometimes that it's, uh, you care what kind of uh, content that you have, and you don't want anybody to see it. But most importantly, on the outside surface of the envelope, you write what the postman should know. The postman has to know whether there's enough stamps. What what is who's going to receive it? What is the destination address? And who's sending it? And that information has nothing to do with what content you have in there. Okay? So the header is like the envelope outside surface. You put the details that are necessary to go with the message, but has nothing to do with the content. Okay? So so basically things like. What is the timestamp, right? Or what is the uh, what is the ID, or, or what is the the addressing information, or is the the uh, if if you encrypt it, things that are relevant to the encryption or decryption of the message, all these things that are relevant to the message but has nothing to do with content goes in the header. The content of the message goes in the body. So that's the difference. Right? And body is the mandatory element, meaning whatever you send, you have to have SOAP body. Yes. And, and the, the body is basically what the content. Right? It's, uh, it may not contain anything about security. It may not contain anything about reliability. It contain, contains only the, uh, the, the relevant things. So in this case, it's an itinerary. So the it basically says departing from New York arriving in Los Angeles the day, you know when uh, what is the seat and all that, right? And and this has nothing to do. This details has nothing to do with whether this is being transmitted securely or not, right? You can either send se send it securely or you can just send it so that everybody can see. It has nothing to do with it. So that's why it's sort of separate, right? And it makes it. Uh, much clearer when you want to uh, implement a service. 
so so there is a special style of the body called soap fold this fold element is again part of the env this this and soap soap namespace there are special cases when you send the fold soap falls you send when your service generates a fault meaning something like this when you access a website what if the page is not there whatever the url you typed is no longer there what would you see on your browser you will see a 404 right or you you pass some invalid parameters or something went wrong with the server you will see a 500 server error or whatever right how do you how do you deal with that situation like errors and you know missing values or something when it comes to web service how do you make sense to the the other end the, the machine at the other end that oh you, there was something wrong here you basically send a soap fault right that's what the faults are for and the faults are special so for the fault there 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 are multiple sub elements there's something called the code element there's a sub code there are, there are reasons and and it's you can send from something like a java stack trace completely enclo enclosed in the soap fault right? um so yeah sorry uh, sorry you have an element you know head and body right so uh, and uh, head and body is is, is both of them are mandatory no uh, only the body is mandatory okay, uh, so, so this is a, a valid soap message okay. because it has only body yeah Okay then, then so uh, so this itself contains a message, right? Yeah. So so I'm sending soap message to somebody else. Right. So if the header is missing, yeah. So how did it goes to the receiver? So so if it's just point to point, mm -hmm. right? Then then it wouldn't make any any uh, any any problem for them. So I'm sending you a message. and I, i if i don't include any header information especially addressing information you think that it's for you and you just process it right because it's it's go going to be on on http link right but if you are supposed to send it to say mike here right so i'm i'm i i can't call mike directly but i can call you and i want to tell you explicitly hey this is actually not supposed to be consumed by you this is supposed to be consumed by mike So in that case, I have to put header information. Otherwise, you you don't know, right? So I have to explicitly mention to you that this is not for you. This is for somebody else. That piece of information must be in the header, and it, you should I should have a header. But if it's just point to point, if it's between you and me, I can ignore the header. Oh yeah, I mean if if there's nothing else to be talked about, meaning if I don't want reliability, I don't want security, I don't want anything else. I just want to send you a message. then i can ignore the header completely but uh, on the other hand if i if i want to do if i want you to do anything other than cons just consuming the message i have to include all the details in the header so so say say if you take ws security ws security is actually a very lengthy very detailed protocol and so if if you want to encrypt this message right the simplest en encryption header would be four times roughly about four times longer than this message so so ws security headers are the most notorious ones for being huge right so uh, that's how it is so in that case you have to have a header right but uh, if if you don't have any any other information then this will go fast not really like so let's say let's say you 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 have a, a service endpoint and i'm calling you so i can call you without any header because i'm directing my messages to you right you are not acting as any special node or any special intermediary or whatever so and and if you actually say that i have to have a header you can say it in many ways so you see in 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 your service description you can say oh you have to have this particular disc description when you call me or you have to have this particular policy uh, in implemented when you call me then i have to include the header 
you have the right to say I don't accept any message that comes without a header. But if you don't say that, then uh, I can just send you a message without a header. Because see, the SOAP build, builds on top of HTTP. Right? So the concept of HTTP is that HTTP is a pull type protocol. Pull meaning the server is not going to send you anything if you don't ask for it. Is that clear? So, so is MSN.com or whatever, Fox News, let's say, right? Is it going to trust anything to you without you asking the website? No. They can't do it. Why? Because it's a pull protocol. You, you ask for it, then only it responds. Right? So similarly, when you, because web services are primarily on top of HTTP, you have to ask for it. Meaning you have to call that URL with some input and then only the server responds. Right? So if you don't include any extra information on your message, the server thinks, oh, it's for me. I'll try to deal with it. That's how it works. So that's why the, the, the header is optional. Maybe. So these things I'm gonna probably, oh, sorry. These things I'm gonna probably uh, skip. Uh, the ultimate sender, ultimate receiver, all this. So that's why I said there, there are some, sometimes you uh, keep people in the middle and you will have to explicitly say, okay, this is not for the people in the middle. This guy is the ultimate receiver. This guy is the person who, who's supposed to receive this, like that, right? So there are some attributes that goes in the header that says okay or that, and then there's one something called the must understand attribute. So uh, if you want to enforce security, let's say, right, you want to have intermediaries and clients that understand <coughs> security headers. Right? Some clients may not understand, and and you want to enforce in your message saying. If at least one guy in the route doesn't understand this, they are, they are not supposed to do anything with it. They are just supposed to send it back or don't do, don't process it further, sort of. How do you do that? You use this thing called must understand header. You say must understand security. And then <coughs> if, if any node doesn't understand, must understand, uh, the, a must understand header, it will uh, return a fault saying header mark must understand could not be. So there are many. These are basically many tweaks that are specified by SOAP. Uh, okay. So this is what I call meant by protocol binding. Protocol bindings are, as I said, SOAP is a text-based protocol, and it must be, you know, put on top of an existing application level protocol. The most uh, prominent candidates are HTTP and SMTP. Really, what happened uh, with web services is that HTTP is the protocol that's used, say, 95% of the time, and SMTP maybe three or four times, and all these other protocols that that SOAP was built for was that rest two percent or whatever. So, after all that time, then then when when all this happened. People who observed this said, hey, look at this. 95% of the traffic is going on HTTP. And you are not making an assumption about HTTP. You are not using any, any security protocols that were built on HTTP, say something like HTTPS. So that's the, the starting movement of REST. Because they, they looked at the, this whole very intricate you know, framework of web services and said, you see, all this junk, all this complexity can be reduced if you assume that you are sending messages via HTTP. This whole thing happened because you wanted to make, remove that assumption and uh, rebuild everything else. Right? So that's sort of the, the start of the other web service movement, which we call RESTful web service movement. I'm hopefully going to talk about that in the next class. Uh, okay. So I'm going to very quickly go through WSDL and hopefully I can show you an example first. Uh, uh, so so WSDL uh, is this XML based language, right? Let me actually show you a WSDL. Uh, 
let's see, I think this is one should have a Noises one should have a access to. Yeah. Um, so here's a very, very simple service. And this is a WSDL file. Right. This WSDL file, see, so there's, here's, here's a little thing that, that you, you guys might realize. This is a schema, XML schema piece. So the, there's a piece of schema that says, okay, these are the valid message types. And then there's a piece that says, these are the messages. And then there's a piece that says, uh, uh, a port type is like a class. And says that this is the service and these are the methods. And each method has input, output, fault. Fault is actually option. So it says, in order for you to access this method, you must provide an input of this type and you will get an output of this type. Right? If there was some fault, you will get a fault message like this. That's what it says. Right? And then uh, this this binding piece says, how, sh how should you package your XML? Should you just send the raw XML or should you package it with uh, SOAP? And uh, in this case, it's basically SOAP. This is how you refer to SOAP. We just you, you refer to it with the uh, URL, and then there are styles in use uh, using SOAP. There's one called literal, meaning you just put the SOAP, put the XML inside the SOAP body, and that's it. And uh, there's another one called RPC, which mandates that you should have some more elements surrounding it and all that. So that's not not that's too much detail for us. Basically, what you want to what you what I want to show you is that it has these, all these details, right? And and here's here's the URL that actually implements this piece, this service. Right? The WSDL contains all these details. And really, if you actually think of writing this, writing a valid WSDL by hand, it's extremely difficult. And uh, it's actually not supposed to be written by humans. It was supposed to be generated by machines. Um, so, this is what a WSDL looks like. Right? Now, in our, uh, so these these were the main components, and, and I'm probably gonna quickly uh, go through all this. Yeah, then so e each of this the, these presentations were actually made for a different class called services. Science, I think, right? Uh, so, we spent one class on WSD, and we spent one class on soup completely. So uh, this is I'm um, sort of like running through all this in one class, which the content that I covered in four classes. But so uh, that's why I said I want to skip some of this. As far as you are, you as this course goes, all I want you to understand is that there's this thing called web services, right? You use a XML protocol or XML thing called version, uh, like uh, sorry, soup, and uh, you have you have a descriptor file called a WSDL. All are in XML, right? Um, yeah, there are aspect changes, and uh, uh, yeah, we will skip the UDD piece. Let me see whether I can actually give you a quick demo on uh, Axis two. So Axis2 is uh, a, software, basically it's, you can get it as a WAR file, web archive file. So when, when you get Axis2, you get several things. One is that you get a, a what we call a SOAP engine. You, uh, it has everything that you need to process the SOAP messages, meaning that, okay, you want to secure a SOAP message. How do you do that? Securing is basically a, uh, a matter of inserting some headers into your SOAP message, right? So, so the Access 2 has something called modules. So you download a module, you put it in the system, and you say enable this module, and then all your messages will be secured. 
So axis 2 will take care of inserting the right headers to your message. Then let's say you want to implement a web service. You don't have to write all this code to you know pass XML and write XML. All these things are unnecessary completely. What you do is when you use Axis 2, it lets you, it generates everything for you, except the piece of logic that you have to write. So it will provide you a nice Java method to fill with everything in objects, right? So uh, all the values that you you can generate uh, can be objects or strings, and then you uh, then you just fill in the blanks, and then you say submit the, or put this as a service, and Access Two can do that. Right? So it's basically a, a, uh, uh, this uh, whole framework plus a set of tools that lets you do web services very easily. Um, so if if you download Access Two. I think there are three options for you. One is the zip file. Uh, yeah, so standard binary distribution is basically the zip file, right? And the source distribution is the source, meaning uh, the raw Java file. So it won't have a binary one, which you uh, which you'll have to create using ant. The war or web archive distribution is a war file that you can directly put in Tomcat. Right? When you put this in Tomcat, this is what you will see. Uh, this is what you will see. And and this has a admin console. I think this, uh, this probably has the yeah, standard uh, username and password. So uh, you can <laughs> upload services, right? So <coughs> Access 2 has this concept of a service archive, which we call an Access Archive or R file, right? Again, uh, a, a zip file with a specific format, right? And you can upload those, and it will uh, instantly become a service, right? And you can check the available services, and this is uh, we actually have this one for for one of those uh, one of our colleagues who is having a. Uh, web service to enable the mapping, uh, you know, ontology mapping and matching things. So that's what Blooms is. Um, so there are many things that you can do. There. So modules is where, see, there are multiple modules. The, there's one called uh, metadata exchange, there's one called addressing, and uh, uh, all these modules like security are not even listed yet. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things that you can do by going through this console to access to, right? And you can use access to libraries in in your client side to pass messages also. Now, I was thinking of doing a quick. Uh, Thinking of doing a quick client. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me see whether I can log into my. Uh, is there a VNC? Um, who, who is uh, 63KXK? Oh, you are, okay. Well, sorry, I, I, because the, your website was empty. I was, I had no, no, no I, name, anything that goes with that. So I was looking for who is KXK and I thought it's a, a, a Spanish friend who left the post half way. So that's why. <laughs>
So, so if you have access to, the, there's a tool called WSDL to Java. I think I have to. So there's a WSPL to Java that comes into your, uh, your path, or it's an executable. Basically, it does what it what it says, what the name says. It converts WSDLs to Java code. Right? So so you basically do a WSDL to Java. Let me actually show you what. Uh, uh, I don't even have Java code. So here, here are the options. Let me actually show this in a more nicer way. So there are many, many options that you can pass. They can, you can even even say what language of code you want. So the default is Java, but you can also say I want I want C code, yeah. and and you can generate what we call server side code. You can change namespace mappings, and you can. Uh, you can put the files there wherever you want. You can specify what is the version of the WSDL that you're using. But all these are options, right? So basically, all you need need to know in order to generate code is uh, the URL of your WSDL file. So so basically, all I have to say is yeah, minus URL. And this one is uh, is this one? Let me actually grab the the version version service. Right, this is the WSDN. and. Uh, All, all I do is I paste the URL there and enter. And okay, what did I do? Oh, sorry, I, I misspelled it. It should not be URL, but it should be URI. So it will get the document and it did something, right? So if you look at it now. You will see that it generated source file, it generated an ant file, and all that. So let me open this in Eclipse and show you what's there. Okay, where's my Eclipse? Right next to it. Yeah. Okay, so that that probably went here. So unfortunately, VNC doesn't understand or. This concept of dual desktop, so it shows you everything. And let me do a new Java project called Nexus 2 Code, which is the X same project as that. It's probably gonna make some, some noise. 
because it's uh, the, the access to libraries are not there. But uh, so see, see, it generates a lot of code, right? And and this version stuff is also a lot of code. But uh, what is important for you to know is that. Yeah, so this is a huge file. Right? What is important for you to know is that uh, this one is a encapsulation of all things that the service does. But uh, you will you will have a nice method. So let me actually add the access to code, like the libraries, and show you how this compiles. I hope this is not like a, because you guys have done uh, uh, you guys have used my uh, code so you probably know all this right All you have to do is uh, create a new uh, version stub, right? Like this. And the version stub will have a uh, get version method. Because the original service had a method called get version. This generate the code to have a get version method. So all you do is this is all you do to access the service. So it, it's uh, unlining it in red because it's uh, uh, it's throwing an exception and I'm not catching it. But let me just do that. Right? So let me do a uh, right. so all that encoding in XML you know headers and body and point to the right URL handling faults everything is done for you if there was actually a fault that comes from the other side this code will throw an exception where you can catch it here so you don't even have to know that soap sends an exception a, a, a fault and then uh, the Java con converts it to an exception and that's all of uh, what uh, access to takes care of. So if I run this now, you should probably see some output. This is one of the standard services that's, that's uh, provided to uh, Oh, okay. So it it's 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 sent a response object. So I have to say uh, something like uh, it return, which is a string. This came from the service. I can prove it to you by doing a TCP mon on this one.
so it's pointing to axis two in axis one. So let me do this to axis one dot uh, dot edu, and the port is eighty. Then uh, here I'm gonna slightly change the code in this stud right? uh, so that it uh, the URL that it points to is not. Uh, so I, I, I suppose everybody has played with TCP mod at least to some extent and knows. Uh, what I'm trying to do here, right? So basically, what we're trying to do here is to redirect the the request to a different uh, host. Instead of this one, I'm going to say localhost port 9090, right? Uh, and then run it once again. So then the, the actual URL request will go to my localhost, but the localhost is pointing basically the same output, right? But now if I look at this one, you see, there's a huge chunk of XML that went and came back. Let me let me clear this up and uh, do it once again with XML formatting so that you can actually see it much better. Here, here you go. Right. So now here's the the, the formatted message. Uh, you see, it's a. You see, this is the message that went in. It sent an empty body because it didn't ask for anything, right? But you see, it, it's properly formatted. You didn't do anything. It's properly formatted. It, it has the right namespace and all, right? It has the envelope element. It has the body element. And this is the message that came back. It has the body element, no headers, but uh, it basically has a particular namespace and a return element enclosed with it. So this is what web says is all about. So, so there's a hugely complicated body of uh, protocols and systems underlying this. But as consumers and creators of services, you don't actually have to know everything. You have to know bas basically the basic concepts of it, uh, of what SOAP is, where does WSDL fit in, and all that, and then there are a bunch of tools that you can use to, you know, create WSDLs, create services, and get things running. So, so next time, next class, we we are going to look at web services, but a different breed of web services, which we call RESTful services. And that class is probably the most useful class uh, for you in your project, I suppose, because I'm going to discuss of, of what are RESTful services and how do you use them and uh, we are going to look at what we call a mashup, right? So if you heard of uh, things that they do with these maps, you know they all, all these most of these sites have a thing that has a map and you can click on the map and something will pop up and you click on that and it will show something on the map again. So th those things where you mix and match services is what we call mashups. So we're going to discuss about that and so on. So if you have questions about the paper, talk to me and that's it for today.
Oh, maybe. Actually, <laughs> yeah. you too. <laughs> yeah. um, I was just wondering, did we not get the extra points? Um, uh, we have the extra points. We did it all to go and Yes, I had to go. But we did okay. And did you actually make the 30%? Yes, I've seen a lot of you guys. 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 Uh, so, so this is this only counts for 30 points. Most of you guys mean like 26 or 25 or whatever. So you thought that I can be the only point. Yeah, that is there. Well, they read about that. I was going to say, I didn't mean to be directly. I didn't do it. Okay, yeah. If I was going to do it, it's not weird. What's the story? Now I'm going to get another idea or something like that. Well, it's a good idea. Whatever. It's inside the box. Um, it like was right on this page. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 the the uh, 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 uh,